In the world of sneakers, there are a handful of innovations that have changed the entire outlook industry-wide. The Reebok Pump was one such innovation. It changed the game forever, revolutionizing how we experience comfort and performance. This is the story of the Reebok Pump, a tale of ingenuity, competition, and a technological leap that captured the hearts of athletes and sneaker enthusiasts and most importantly, put Reebok in a serious contender spot in a sneaker race. But what happened? How did Reebok, despite the cultural phenomenon that the pump was, fall to where they are now? And better still, what made the pump such a groundbreaking design in the 90s? Well, let's find out. I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com, and this is the rise and fall of the Reebok Pump Sneaker and Company. But before we get started, please take a sec to hit the like button for me. It shows support for the channel, and at this point, we're pretty small, so it really helps us out at this level. But with that being said, let's get to it. Our journey begins in the vibrant era of the 1980s where sneakers were not just footwear, but expression and style status. But it wasn't always that way. You see, this was a new trend of the day. Prior to the 80s, most people wore slacks and button-up shirts and hard-bottom shoes to do everything from lounging to cutting the grass in. <laughs> and I mean, I joke, I'm sure they had stuff like chucks or something and wore jeans. But the point is, the sneaker industry was minuscule and no one gave any thought to sneaker styling. Converse basically ruled the roost. They were first in and best dressed, and this caused them to get a bit comfortable in their top spot. But changes were down the proverbial street, and these changes had no intentions of playing nicely. The story of Phil Knight and Nike is a whole story in and of itself, and in fact, they made a movie about it. You might have saw it. But, long story short, when they managed to coax Jordan over in 1985, it marked a serious turning point for the entire industry. The Air Jordan series ignited the sneaker craze and established the concept of celebrity endorsements and limited edition releases. A concept that though Nike didn't create, they did manage to take to a whole new level. All this drove an arms race of sorts between three relative newcomers who had all but muscled Converse out of the game. Nike, Adidas, and Reebok. Adidas was the older of the three, but Nike's power moves in basketball proved to be the next big thing in the industry, and Reebok wanted in on the action. In the 80s, this was the time of innovation and experimentation in the sneaker world. Brands were pushing boundaries to create unique features and set their sneakers apart. Reebok, being the youngling on the block, knew that if they wanted to make a splash in basketball, they had to do something big. So enter the Reebok Pump, the brainchild of Paul Letchfield, a creative visionary who sought to combine performance and personalized fit like never before. Paul had a grand scheme that would give athletes the power to control the fit of their shoes in real time, enhancing their performance and comfort. Nike had already innovated tech that incorporated revolutionary air cushioning units in the soles of shoes back in 1978 with the Nike Air Tailwind, but Paul had an idea that would one-up them. Inspired by the idea of an inflatable ski boot, he and his team set out to bring his groundbreaking vision to life. The result was the pump technology. A few squeezes of the pump's button would inflate the bladder inside the shoe, creating a snug and customized fit around the foot, which was actually a dial back from Paul's original idea, which was to have a unit with a mechanism on the back where you could set your desired air pressure, and every time you took a step, the shoes would reinflate themselves to your specified level. Suffice to say, Paul was probably playing Icarus on that one considering this was the 80s, so they wanted up settling with the tongue pump unit. The Reebok pump made its grand debut in 1989, 
accompanied by futuristic advertising campaigns that captured the imagination of sneaker enthusiasts worldwide. But the defining moment for the pump was the now iconic footage of D. Brown inflating his Reebok pumps before busting off a crazy no-look dunk from damn near the free throw line in the 1991 NBA Slam Dunk Contest. The campaign worked though, because overnight every kid in the country had to have a pair of pumps. And at the then record high of $170 of early 90s money, that was no small ask. But still, they flew off shelves. People were drawn to the interactive experience of pumping up their shoes, feeling the air cushioning embrace their feet, and experiencing a level of comfort and support previously unseen in footwear. As the Reebok pump made its debut, it quickly transcended its functional purposes. It began getting appearances in movies and TV shows. The pump must have had suits at Reebok thinking that maybe they had a legit chance at taking over the number two spot. And dare they say, perhaps even the number one. They had one big problem though. They needed a superstar to promote the brand. They needed a Michael Jordan type figure. So imagine the elation that they must have felt when they landed Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq was a force of nature when he came into the league back in the day. He did movies, he rapped, he had a likable personality, and most importantly, he was a beast on the court. Nike had Jordan and they were basically printing money. So when Reebok landed Shaq, they felt that they had the next big thing in the NBA. They wasted no time designing signature shoes for him, including the iconic Shaq Gnosis and even pump models. All was going well in the partnership until one day, while at an event, Shaq was approached by a mom who expressed how much her son admired him on the court and wanted to have his shoes, but they cost way too much for her to afford. In an apocryphal moment, when Shaq offered her money to buy a pair for her kid, the proud mom exclaimed, I don't want your damn money. <laughs> Shaq walked away from his exchange determined to make his shoes more affordable for an average person. Which obviously didn't work well for Reebok, seeing as though they're a multinational and all, and wanted to make as much money as possible. Poor people be damned. Ultimately, Shaq would leave after his contract expired, and Reebok was out one superstar. Shortly after this, Reebok would continue to be confronted with problem after problem. Also, Reebok had seen the initial success and threw all their eggs into the pump basket. Meanwhile, Nike had been diversifying with tech like responsive cushioning and tons of other looks. As the 90s wore on, the pump began to lose favor. I mean, it was cool when it launched a couple of years earlier, but years into their run, it basically had ran its course and Reebok had nothing to backdoor it with. Not to mention, Reebok being a smaller company didn't have the money that Nike did to pour into distribution and marketing. Which basically drove the death nail into any hopes that Reebok had in gaining market share. At the time, Nike was in the beginning of their Leviathan phase. And boy, do I have some juicy info on the behind the scenes dirt at Nike. And the lengths that they'll go to in order to maintain their top spot. I got some really big stuff coming up in the works here soon, and I can't really go into detail now, but stay tuned because Nike is pretty slimy behind the scenes, and as soon as this other thing releases, I'll be able to tell the entire sordid story. The 90s was the golden age of sneaker ads, and Nike was king, while Reebok's marketing campaign often lacked the emotional resonance and storytelling that Nike was able to convey. All in all, Reebok's struggle to gain more market share can ultimately be attributed to a combination of factors. All problems that continue to plague Reebok to this day, down to their most recent L being a disaster that was the failed UFC deal. The UFC packs epitomize the problem with Reebok today. For whatever reason, they refuse to go out and hire talented help to design things that people actually like to look at. The UFC kits were an abomination. 
and pretty much nobody liked them. Not to mention the whole screw job deals that they did and made for the fighters, but that's a whole nother story. Point is, things have gotten so bad for Reebok that today they could be found in Walmart, a place where all used to be brands go to die. And whether or not Reebok can bounce back to being an actual contender is pretty unclear at this moment. And personally, I don't think so. I mean, anything is possible, but short of a massive overhaul, I really just don't see it. Which is bad though, because they did have glimmers of hope at one point in time. But what do you think? Were you a fan of Reebok back in the day? Do you still wear the stuff now? Hit us up in the comment section and let us know. And if you enjoyed the video, we hope that you hit the like button for us. Liking and sharing the videos is the best way to help the YouTube algorithms notice us so that we can continue to grow as a channel. And if you want to be updated when the next episode drops, hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell and that way you'll stay keyed in. But with that being said, I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com signing out. Until next time, peace.